Okay, so welcome everyone to the Spartacus panel on Iran on the left with our two veteran leftist speakers, Azar Majadi, who is a founding member of the Workers' Communist Party of Iran and who is now an ex-member, and Yasmin Mather, who uh, is uh, working on the Hands of the People of Iran campaign. And due to an illness, we had a last minute cancellation from Hassan Mar Marafipur, who's a political activist and an analytic of Marxism. Um, later on, I will just read out his statement. Um, so Platypus, who's hosting this event, is an international student group who organizes reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism, focusing on the problems and the tasks inherited from the old, the new, and the post-political left. Um, in advance, we sent the following questions to our, uh, to our panelists. Um, what is your political analysis of the current mass uprising? What are the reasons underlying this crisis? What needs to change and what is needed to achieve that? How would you characterize the current mass uprising? Is it a feminist revolution, a workers' movement, a struggle for national self-determination, or neither or all of them? Is there a relationship between the causes of the revolution in 1979 and the causes of the current crisis? How about the mass protests and crises in the 90s, in 2009, in 2017, um, and in 2019? Is there a relationship to the political crisis of neoliberalism that we have seen earlier in the advanced capitalist countries? And lastly, does the mass uprising in Iran pose the need for an internationally organized left? And if so, how? Um, so now each speaker has about 15 minutes for their introduction. Um, then they have the chance to briefly respond to each other for five to 10 minutes. Um, and then I will open it up to the Q&A. Um, but before I start, um, <clears throat> I will um, read out um, Hassan and Marifur's, um, Maripur's statement, uh, which he sent me in advance. He's very sorry that he cannot come. Um, okay, one second. <clears throat> so this will take about um, 10 minutes approximately. Um, so, um, the reasons for the present revolutionary mass uprising, which have put the whole country in flames for more than two months in Iran and have wrapped the rulers in a kind of sleeplessness, are economic, social, hegemonic, cultural, and moral eruption with the legitimacy of the regime. On the one hand, the people have been experiencing for almost 44 years the economic permanent crisis that prevailed during the time of the Shah regime as well. There is a radical neoliberal policy in Iran in terms of political economy, which has been introduced more openly than ever before, um, ever since the presidency of Rafsanjani and the so-called project of reconstruction after the longest industrial war between Khomeini's regime and the Ba'ath regime of Iraq for the integration of Iranian capital with international capital. The neoliberalization of the economy had been had been thought of as a green light for international capital and the merging of Iranian um, capital into international capital with the uh, intensification of commodification, reification of interpersonal relations, enforcement of um, precarization of labor. This fetishization of education, medicine, housing, etc., cetera, um, were enforced more and more um, piecemeal by different governments and with the presidency of Khatami, this neoliberalization evolved into a discourse between civilizations in order to save Islamic fascism on the one hand, and on the other hand, to show a rational face of the regime towards Western neoliberal capitalism um, with apparently left liberal postmodern theories of Habamas um, that the regime was following the policies of the World Bank and IMF, and at the time of Ahmadinejad, again, with the abolition of subsidies and the implementation of the most aggressive form of neoliberalism and the commodification of life and the payment of subsidies in monetary form and the price freeing of goods um, had led to a catastrophic inflation, poverty um, and controllable uh, price increases of the products, housing shortage and the asymmetry between the income of the majority of the population and the expenses led to the destruction of the value of the Iranian currency and an absolute crisis that cannot be solved with the capitalist logic. At the same time, the Iranian monopoly capital and so-called revolutionary guard rather profits from this catastrophic situation and invests 
the over accumulation in terrorism, in war, and the formation of a fascist entity um, called Shiite Moon in Persian, Helal -e Shiai, uh, in the Middle East against the hegemonic power of Western imper imperialism. This apparent hegemonic struggle between Western imperialism and regional imperialism of Iran in the Middle East makes the Iranian regime attractive for so-called cross-front leftists and fake anti-imperialists. However, we have to make it clear here that the two types of bourgeois left appearing currents, which present themselves as the established left in people's minds, the pseudo anti-imperialist left and the left liberal pro-imperialists, um, who are more or less pre uh, who more or less present the wars and interventions of NATO as liberation, have been able to posture as left. Um, although they, they do not have anything to do with a proletarian class standpoint, with the revolutionary real politic um, and socialist consciousness. These two currents still think in a block logic. Ideologically, they still live in the time of the Cold War. One supports the Western values and modernization without thinking that colonialism, absolute exploitation of slaves, um, stabilization of slavery and fascism are all products of liberalism and a capitalist mode of production in Western moder modernization. The other current, which presents itself as anti-imperialist, justifies the power and practice of the ultra-right states and anti-human fascist states and the so-called global south to the working class and to the people, because they always assume that these states, like Iran, are an alternative against Western imperialism. Both these currents, despite their differences with and from each other, represent a bourgeois class standpoint and do not even accept the working class as a subject of revolution. The revolution in Iran is not a feminist revolution, although the emancipation of women plays a major role in this revolution. When I speak of feminist revolution, I must also be able to grasp the essence of this revolution and represent this essence to the people who have not yet grasped grasped it in such a way that they're convinced. The vulgar left, however, tries to trivialize the concepts in order to disguise its false class standpoint ideologically. If we consider just quantitatively the number of women participating in the revolutionary uprising up to this very point in time, they do not represent a majority. There were, of course, many women, but as the brutality, violence, and repression increases, the number of women participating decrease decreases. If we argue, as the PKK-affiliated postmodern nationalists and communalists argue, that the death of Gina Amini started this revolution, and therefore this revolution is feminine or feminist, then we reduce the totality of this, um, of the economic crisis, hegemonic and cultural collapse of Islamic fascism to the death of a woman by the police, and we do not put reality as the whole in its totality and in dialectical relationship to each other. But if we translate the feminist revolution in such a way that no revolution can reach a proper goal without the participation and the co-leadership of women, then I say, yes, this revolution is a socialist revolution that must enable the emancipation of women, as Friga Hauk said it, meaning the spheres of production, politics, art, and culture, and re reproduction. This liberation in all these areas cannot be achieved within the framework of, bourgeois, of the bourgeois order and the capitalist mode of production, commodity, fetishism, reification of the interpersonal relationships, etc. The left liberals, supporters of progressive neoliberalism, as Nancy Fraser enthusiastically spoke of it, speaks to present themselves as culturally left but they are ultra conservative, whether they may present themselves as Workers Communist Party of Iran or anti deutsch communists or something else. The anti-imperialist leftists represent another form of cross-front um, left liberalism, like the anti deutsch These kind of leftists supported the fascist rule of the regime and tried to make Qasem Soleimani into their hero. Fascism is a pseudo-socialism and an aesthetic promise of use as um, Wolfgang Fritz Haug in his book, Critique of the Aesthetics of Commodities, in reference to Walter Benjamin's essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Its Technical Reproductibility, presents fascism as a pseudo-socialism that wants to enforce the aesthetization of politics and presents its politics, um, present its politics consumable and pleasant for people without questioning private property. 
Fascism wants to organize the proletariat in this sense without doing anything against private property. Hitler also had exactly such ideas as Khomeini, he used socialism as a sham, although he had Atatürk and Mussolini and fascism as a goal. He spoke to the Germans um, that everyone can own a VW, um, it's a German car, in a time of world economic crisis. Khomeini had also made such promises before coming to power and his anti-imperialism was, um, was a sham socialism for justifying his essential fascism. In other words, I can say that Khomeini was never against imperialism, but he himself wanted to impose a capitalist rule that could um, that couldn't, could end up becoming regional imperialism. Khomeini had talked about the conquest of the Islamic world and about an Islamic state and Omar uh, nation um, in the beginning. Um, he had talked about the conquest of Jerus Jerusalem by uh, Karbala in the time of the war between the Khomeini regime and the Ba'ath regime. All capitalist states have equally um, imperialist tendencies. Khomeini reduced imperialism to the USA, which nowadays many cross-front leftists, but better said fascists, with the leftist appearance also do. Um, the definition of imperialism on the basis of the historical development of capitalism to a higher state, a stage, which on the one hand globalizes the capitalist mode of production, and on the other hand combines the enforcement of the interests of the imperialist states with the hegemony and physical violence by monopoly capitalism or monopoly capitalisms. All these developments must be considered within the framework of the critique of political economy, critique of the bourgeois mode of production in general, critique of fetishism, et cetera, et cetera, and with the historical materialism as a method for demanding the situation of the working class and changing the situation in the sense of the emancipation of the working class. Any moral, cultural, reactionary criticism of imperialism, as in the sense of Orientalism of Edward Said, who conceives imperialism as a kind of cultural dis dispossession or philo-colonialism expressed with Lozurdo, as in the case with the Frankfurt School, especially Adorno and Horkheimer, must not be understood as anti-imperialist and communist or Marxist. Georg Lukacs in his book Lenin spoke of Lenin's analysis of imperialism and believes that his analysis of imperialism was not a purely theoretical superiority or practical of practical genius or practical um, perspic perspicacity, but Lenin had studied realpolitik and in this way developed for the concrete political situation, a concrete analysis that described the situation very clearly from a Marxist point of view. Um, Lukács, 1924. Imperialism is the political expression of the process of capital accumulation in its competitive struggle for the rem remnants of the non-capitalist world milieu that has not yet been seized. Geographically, this uh, milieu still encompasses the widest areas of the earth today. Um, he then cites Luxembourg. Um, <clears throat> fascism is no more than hypercapitalism, and hypercapitalism cannot be against imperialism because it is because it is itself imperialist. When the fascists use leftist rhetoric, we must not give up using our terms, but show exactly why these barbarians use the uh, use the pseudo socialism as an aesthetic um, use promise to use exactly the form of an appearance to convey another being. Um, I'm just going to finish reading this paragraph and then I'll stop it right here. Um, so if the shortest, this is a Lenin quote, if the shortest possible definition of imperialism were required, it would have to be said that imperialism is the monopolistic stage of capitalism. Such a definition would contain the main thing because on the one hand, finance capital is the banking capital of a few monopolistic big banks merged with the capital of monopolistic industrialist associations. And on the other hand, the division of the world is the transition from a colonial policy extending unhindered to territories not yet conquered by any capitalist power to a colonial policy of monopolistic domination of the territory of the earth divided without rest. Um, in many respects, this definition by Lenin applies to the Iranian bourgeoisie under the rule of fascist Islamists. The Iranian state is in many ways more imperialist than Germany, than Germany of 1911. 
It is more imperialist than Japan in 1917 and Russia before the October Revolution. We as communists must not be swayed by this bullshit rhetoric of the fascists about imperialism and anti-imperialism, but attack English style capitalism and want to abolish it. Iranian society has undergone serious changes in the past year. The balance of power has changed in favor of the workers. We can never compare the uprising of Aban, um, uh, 1398, this is the Iranian calendar, what he means is November 2019, uh, sorry, um, with the uprising of um, December 2017. On the one hand, Iran's bourgeois political structure has reached a political, political economic dead end and has no desire to resolve the uh, people's economic problems. On the other hand, it uses the current condition of the economic crisis and the sanctions in favor of accumulating more capital to spread regional terrorism. The primary victims of economic sanctions were the weakest strata of the working class. Over time, these sanctions generally, generally lead to the proletarianization of society, poverty, and misery of the vast majority of people, which com compromises, uh, oh, sorry, which comprises about 90% of the country's population. It also led to the proletarianization of the petty bourgeoisie and the destruction of the vast majority of the middle class. Except for an ostentation, um, Nostalgia, nothing is left of the petty bourgeoisie in Iran. Iran's bourgeoisie, hoping to return to the era when gasoline was cheap, had also some sort of mental orgasm with the memories of the past. This is very similar to the pre-COVID condition of Europe and similar to the crisis of the petty bourgeoisie in Germany uh, in 2008, who was nostalgic for the good old times of the mark before the formation of the European Union. Islamic fascism in Iran is experiencing the worst kind of defeat. The, hege the hegemony of the regime and all other right-wing and conservative forces, from monarchists to liberals, has been defeated. The majority of the population is radical and militant, in contrast to other uprisings in the last four years, notably in December 2017 and November 2019, as well as other a series of other strikes that lasted more than 100 days in the petrochemical oil industry. There are still two more pages, but I'm going to end it here um, and give Yasaman or um, Azar the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. Uh, who should go first, Donna, so I can uh, allow them to uh, unmute? Whoever wants to go first. Just raise your hand or I don't know. Un they cannot unmute themselves. Okay, okay, Aza. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, can you unmute yourself or? Okay. Well, I asked Yasaman to go first, but uh, I was muted, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, well, thank you so much for providing this opportunity to talk to especially young generation, which is very important. And um, I, you know, I think it would be a very, very good opportunity to have this discussion going on. Um, what we see in Iran now, it's it's a very important revolutionary movement uh, to overthrow the regime. If before uh, you mentioned a couple of few dates, which we observed um, a rather mass movement in Iran, and they were all suppressed, uh, crushed, and then we had some years of not uh, protest in that sense of the word, and then began again. This regime has never really had a day with, without protest in one way or the other, only the times that it has really clamped down and crushed the, the, the protest. If, if we go very quickly to the beginning of it, in 1979, there was, there was a revolutionary movement in Iran against the previous regime, which was a monarchy, which was dictatorship, which was, you know, we, we, we had political prisoners, torture, execution, not in the extent that we have now, but I explain why then it was not as uh, huge as it is in, under the Islamic regime. Uh, we had a revolution then to, to overthrow that regime, 
and uh, I believe um, the aspirations of the people was the same as it is now. Having a free society, having equality, having prosperity, a, more, a better world, a more just world. That was the thing against poverty, against workers' exploitation, against censorship, against um, total dictatorship that we had. But it was after we, we ha had a revolutionary movement to overthrow that, and then the society changed. The, the, the left became much stronger in the society as a whole. And the uh, Islamic regime, I'm, I'm sure now, by now everyone knows, came into existence uh, via a regime change the, organized by US and the West. Uh, they, the Shah was the gendarme of the, of the West, the US and uh, Britain and uh, Europe. But then when the revolutionary movement started, uh, US decided that um, he should be taken away and then they had this Islamic solution in order to uh, clamp down on the left, which was their main problem. And also then we had the Cold War. So there was Soviet Union in, in the neighborhood. They wanted to actually oppose that. And if you remember, we had already had Afghanistan with the Mujahideen, which was again uh, organized by the US. And then Islamic regime was another of this Islamization, if you like, of the region. And, uh, and then we had the Taliban, we had Al-Qaeda, and then we, have, we had Daesh just recently. So this has been a project for the past 40 years that they have organized different Islamic organizations, te Islamic terrorism, in order to suppress the people or any protest movement, any uh, attempt to have a freer society and a more equal society. But I'll go back to Iran. So when Islamic regime came to power, it actually an uprising started. And people, uh, the, mostly the left, uh, they went to the jails, they freed political prisoners. So it changed uh, the scenario that they thought, okay, Khomeini will come and they will have this uh, um, sort of government and then things would go the way they wanted to. The left came, became strong. They, some of them had arms after that uh, uprising. So it took only two and a half years from, if you say, February 1979, which was the, uh, the date of the uprising, to uh, June 1981, that Islamic regime organized a coup d'etat like clampdown. I mean, you usually have coup d'etat by the army against the regime, but this time was the regime itself to clamp down, they organized a bloody uh, clamp down on the whole society. And I can say maybe for a decade almost, uh, you, they had total uh, uh, sort of no, no um, freedom. Uh, everybody was taken to, to jail. You had this whole society being on the fear and we never know exact number, but it's talked about 100,000 political prisoners being killed in, in, in prisons, either under torture or being uh, executed. We, we have a lot of mass graves in, in Iran, and one of them has become a, a symbol in, in close to Tehran, which is called Havaran. And then we have these Havaran mothers, which is very similar to Argentinian mothers. If you, if you remember, there were mothers who were seeking their uh, lost children who, who had died under the uh, military coup d'etat in Argentina, also organized by the US. So after, I would say, the trauma of the 80s, which totally uh, changed the face of the society, was then that the veil became uh, obligatory, a total black veil on women, the society became very Islamized and then no, no freedom whatsoever, everyone in the fear of their freedom and their uh, life. Then we started seeing again with the new generation movements to change. And uh, then we, you, those dates that you see, 
first they talked about a kind of state reformist. I call it state reformist, like Khatami, for example, he was not a reformist as such that we would have in mind. He was more trying to keep the regime going because they could see that in the society, there was this whole movement for change against the Islamic rules. Women were even then very active, all the time very active in this movement and the workers beginning to organize themselves. So they started this state reformist and it's been going on until December, 2017. Uh, every, every decade, I must say, we had some kind of protest for a few days. It was clamped down, quiet again, more or less, and then another one. But since December, 2017, this has been ongoing. Even though not every day you see people on the street, not every day you see workers strikes, but never society became quiet as it was maybe for a while before that. December, 2017, it started with mass protests in many cities. Uh, one of them was actually very interesting was Rome, which is the city of the mullahs and the, all of that. And there was the first time people shouted the slogan that we don't want Islamic regime. A slogan against the regime itself, I think it was probably in that sense, widespread that sense was the first time we heard it. And it was another slogan which was very interesting that the students in Tehran actually uh, gave uh, voice to it, was um, the um, reformists and hardliners um, is the end of the game kind of a thing. So they said no more reformist uh, games is going to uh, push anybody back and they're against the regime. And then from uh, this winter of 2018, mass workers uh, strikes started in different places, steel workers and uh, uh, sugarcane industry, which took a long time. And they actually gave rise, a voice to um, workers, uh, general assemblies, and trying for workers' councils. Here, I just, in a bracket, I must say, councils have, workers' councils has a um, history in Iran, has a tradition in Iran. In 1979, the left was strong, and a lot of workers started creating their own councils. By June 1981, but which that clampdown began, a lot of workers had uh, organized councils in their factories, in their workplaces, and we were seeing the buildup of regional workers' councils in different places. But that clampdown stopped everything. So that's why, in order to defeat that or push that back, Islamic regime is, is very clever started its own councils, Islamic councils. It used the word council to actually fight back that um, tradition or that aspiration among the workers to create their own their councils. And then we, we, workers never had, after that, never had free organizations, never were able to create their own organization. 20 years ago, some movement started in a couple of places to have their syndicate, syndica, as we call them, or trade unions, but they didn't really come to much and they were uh, suppressed. But this time around, we started seeing this workers' movement. A lot of uh, workers were taken to jail. They were imprisoned. They were tortured, like Ismail Bakhshi, the leader of the sugarcane industry, who's become a very important worker leader figure in Iran. And he was in prison, tortured, and then he never was able to go back to work, but he still is in uh, workers' movement, especially in the sugar cane. So the workers' movement has always been a part and parcel of what we see in Iran. And now this time around, we've seen a movement against the veil and what they call it a women's movement. I would like to call it women's liberation movement. It's not just a women's movement. You have men and women together on the streets, many times hand in hand, which is very interesting for a country under Islamic rule. They're burning the veil, which is very symbolic. Some people might think that's not important. It is important. I've always said, Organization for Women's Liberation, of which I'm a chair, we've always said, that 
The veil is the banner of the Islamic movement and Islamic regime. It plays a very important ideological role in this movement and in this regime. They cannot really go on and say, okay, the veil is not obligatory. You can, you, you, they would till the end, to death, fight for the veil to, to be an instrument of suppression in Iran because it has a very symbolic role and gender apartheid the same thing. And burning the veil is a very symbolic and what we, they call it uh, turban throwing, which some people again try to make fun of it, is very symbolic. What the people are saying, especially young generation, we do not want Islam rule this country. We want to get rid of it. And in that sense of the word, it's very, very important. So secularism in Iran is one of the instruments but, uh, but I, if you want, we can get, get into it later, what kind of secularism I mean. And then, of course, to outroot religion. So for, for some time, once people, uh, Islam would not have much important place as an ideology in the country, of course, it still would be people who believe in Islam, pray or whatever, that's, that's a different issue. But in social context, social political context, Islam would be outrooted and uh, until they can bring it back again. And in that sense of the word, I have compared it many times to the uh, great French revolution of the 18th century. What it did to church, what it did to Christianity and religion for some time in France, Iran, this revolutionary movement in Iran would have the same effect, not only in Iran, I think it would take the whole region. But, but why is women's revolution liberation movement so important in this movement? Not calling it only a women's movement as the right wing is trying to do, but it's important from the day one that this regime came to power, it had, it, it had this fight, this battle, struggle with the women's liberation movement. The first mass protest movement which took place in Iran was by the women's rights movement. In 8th March, 1979, the regime was not really established yet quite. And we were, I was there and we had, there was many different women's organizations, all organized by different leftist groups. I was in, uh, organ I was uh, with one of them. We were organizing the first eighth free eighth march in Iran. Eighth March was not free in Iran. It's a, it's a communist socialist day. We all know how it came about. And so it was banned. We saw the, we were, we had the first free eighth march. We were organizing meetings. The meeting I was organizing was in the University of Tehran. We had created posters, leaflets, all of that. And right that day that this eighth march was being organized, Khomeini gave a, a, a sort of command that veil must be observed by all public female employees. He did it because I, I think the regime decided to do it once they saw the Eighth March movement. They could not allow that to happen. They had to put a stop to it. So six or seven o'clock in the morning, the news came and then nine o'clock in the morning, you had thousands of women on the streets in Tehran protesting against this uh, rule, ruling and for women's rights, women's freedom, women's equality. It was incredible. So that was the first mass movement that Islamic regime ever experienced. And then it, this movement went on for one week and then the regime had to take it back. So the first defeat of the Islamic regime vis-a-vis -vis the people was again with the women's liberation movement. So this movement has always played a very important role in the society of Iran against the Islamic regime. And now again, in, in this, I think, last phase, hopefully, in this revolutionary movement, women's liberation movement plays a very important and instrumental role against the regime, against its ideology, against its existence. Of course, workers are very active too. We, 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 we've been witnessing 
worker strikes in different industries. Like uh, the one, one of the important ones is steel factory, and then a lot of um, um, sort of car making factories and different municipal workers. We had protests from the teachers. Like for one year previous to that, teachers were pro protesting all over the country. A lot of teacher activists are now in jail. Students' movement has always been very strong in Iran, in both regimes, and they've been very active also, and a lot of university students have been taken to jail. Uh, some of them have died under torture, uh, and uh, there are talks of executions. Uh, we'll see what happens, what the balance of power will do. And it's almost 80 days now. We've never had it so long. But the time, there are differences between this movement and the previous one. One of them is that it's taken so long, like the November 2019 was maybe one week. And officially they said 1500 were killed in that movement and um, it stopped. And now again, we see this movement has taken, you know, it's taken momentum. And then, um, so uh, yes, students, workers, women's rights movement, um, and then we, you see it in neighborhoods, which is very important. In different neighborhoods, you see uh, different activism by the, by the, especially youth, and also other, the other part of the uh, population. And um, when you look at it, for example, I was just in an interview with some uh, with, with a sort of right wing radio uh, TV recently. They were talking, well, we need organization when people in Iran don't have organizations. So this way they wanted to oppose their own organizations being built out in, uh, abroad on the people. So there are actually in neighborhoods, you, uh, youth have begun creating their own organizations. They give uh, the leaflets, they uh, create slogans, they organize protests. And because of the uh, internet technology now, they have a connection all over the country. And then you have workers organizations and you have organizations among students. No national organization, no parties, no leftist parties because of the dictatorship. Soon we will be witnessing also parties and national organizations come into existence. And then um, the, the other question that's always been very uh, part of and parcel of the politics in Iran and different tendencies, uh, right, left, whatever they're trying to take advantage of it, is, the, is so what you call a national question, which the most important one is in Kurdistan, of course. Kurdistan was attacked in um, 1980 or 1980-1981, and then we saw the armed struggle of the partisans or what they call pishmargas uh, for, for a whole decade against the regime. Then finally they were pushed back. And now what we have is also um, eth ethnic nationalism, I would call it, in Kurdistan especially. There are a lot of parties, four, four or five different parties trying to take advantage of the situation to create something if they can, similar to what's going on in Iraqi Kurdistan, not maybe so much independence from the state, uh, uh, from the national government, but something more or less. They've, they've been negotiating with the regime in the past three years. In Norway, especially, they've had a lot of negotiations. They haven't been able to get anywhere now. And, but what happens, which is very interesting, uh, Kurdistan has been in these previous days also a very important place of protests. And uh, these nationalist groups have tried in different ways to impose themselves as leaders, but they haven't really got a response. There is an incredible degree of solidarity between the people of Kurdistan and people of the other parts of Iran. You hear that in their slogans, you hear how they organize uh, days of protest together in their solidarity with each other. Like Mahsa um, Amini, she was from Kurdistan, but she was killed in Tehran. And the first protest against her death actually happened in Tehran by the hospital she was 
uh, taken to. And then in Kurdistan, we had the protests uh, for her funeral. And then for the 40th day after his, this is Islamic uh, Muslim kind of tradition that on the seventh day and 40th day after the death, you have some kind of ceremonies as for sort of memorial of the person, the, the deceased. And, but that was not only in Kurdistan, all over Iran, we saw protests on these days and in solidarity with Gina's family or Maso's family with the, and they also um, all shouting the same slogans. This slogan- Azar, um, sorry, I have yes. to, sorry Azar, um, can, uh, you can come back to this maybe in the second round of responses because you've been talking now for 20 minutes, maybe. Okay. Um, Okay, so can I just say two, two, one sentence and I finish? Okay, just very briefly, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, it, it, you know, I haven't written all my uh, speech. Okay, this is a protest, a revolutionary movement to overthrow the regime for freedom, equality, and prosperity for all the citizens. And you have, is a, is a very radical movement, radical not in the negative sense that's used in verse now, in its traditional, very militant and I, it's uh, to be to for if the aspirations of the people that are shouting on the streets now is to be realized we need to also overthrow capitalism something that now the west is trying to stop by all means thank you thank you so much okay um now yasmin you have um also 20 minutes if you want You need to unmute yourself. Okay, I was muted by the Okay, um, I don't want to repeat what has been said, which covers quite a lot of the if you like, definitions of what is going on. Just to sum up where we are with the current situation, I think the fact that it is so widespread, i.e. it's not limited to a region, it's not limited to a particular part or the urban areas as opposed to rural areas, is one of its main advantages. This is a nationwide struggle and it covers everywhere. Another advantage that this movement has uh, is that there are no reformist leadership because reformist leadership as alluded by the two other speakers as well, were really trying to stop the movement. Their attempts at whenever they have a role in leading a protest movement is to restrain it, is to make sure there's no danger to the Islamic Republic. So they act as uh, uh, forces against that revolution, and they try and bring some reforms that they never can manage because of the definition of the Islamic State. And I think this, all the protests have one thing in common, they rule against the religious state the interference of the state in the private lives of individuals is as important in these struggles as is the um, opposition to repression or political censorship or political dictatorship. So we have to be very clear that there is a very strong anti-religious uh, trend to this movement. And uh, the fact that they throw the amame, the turban or the clerics is one sign of it, but there are hundreds of signs of it. Its slogan, the slogans that it started with, has good points. I'm not denying that, but it has weaknesses. The weakness is that capitalists, uh, imperialists, very strange individuals, Prince Albert of Monaco can defend it. I can defend it, but we are obviously coming from very different views when we say women, life, freedom. And Increasingly, people are saying we are talking about a particular class of women, working women, repressed, oppressed women. Um, and the whole um, issue of um, life, freedom, freedom for whom, life for whom, economy for whom. And these are, if you like, the evolution of the movement is bringing those, the, the weaknesses of the slogan into the forefront. But there's no shortage of other slogans. There are slogans about bread, uh, freedom. Um, there are slogans about setting up councils. There are attempts at 
uh, setting up councils, shoras that was mentioned earlier. So we can be optimistic about that. There is no individual claiming to lead this, and those who claim are talking nonsense. So there is no, if you like, Khomeini, no charismatic leader, no individual who can uh, sell out the movement, but also can create problems. So that is, again, an advantage. There is some organizing, and the organizing is becoming better and better. However, remember that the state has blocked aspects, not all of the internet, because they can't do it, but aspects of the internet. So nationwide struggles are finding um, other ways to try and organize, but that does create problems. Um, and I personally don't think that spontaneous protests um, create their own leadership, but this is a weakness that the left must accept. It's our weakness that we are in this situation with a very sad state, I would say, of the Iranian left, which I will talk about right at the end. Um, I, um, well, you can't foresee how long it will go, but I can't see the state compromising. This state has not kept any of the slogans of 1979. All it has is this stupid veil. That's the only thing, it, it's not anti-imperialist, it's not, it hasn't, not only has it not brought class equality, it, the Gini factor in Iran is higher than most of its neighbors. The gap between the rich and the poor is enormous. So you, you, this state has lost on all grounds, and here, this is its last battle. So it's not going to, if you like, retreat. It's not going to accept the protest. And the protesters aren't giving up. Um, we are on the beginning, the 12th week of these protests, and you can't see it dying down. Yesterday was as strong as two weeks ago. Two weeks ago was as strong as four weeks ago. So it might take different forms. It might be different in one town as opposed to another but it's still going on. So these are all positive points about it. I would say this revolution, this pro these protests are both uh, feminist nationalists, but also so worker struggles. And they are not. They're all of them and none of them. So um, there is an aspect of the initial protests where women were really uh, uh, raising their voice against apartheid. I mean, we've had a case where Iran is not Taliban, is not, um, if you like, Daesh. So uh, under the pressure of what I would say the society, they allowed women to study in universities. But then women come out and they can't get a job. So poverty is very much that of women students, women graduates. When sanctions hit the country, um, which can be blamed on foreign powers, but the Islamic Republic should also be blamed for sanctions. When sanctions hit uh, the poorer families, it is the women who have to A, do part-time jobs, work, uh, take work home because they can't work outside because of the apartheid sexual system, and queue up for hours to get the basic foods that is now there is a shortage in Iran. You can't have you can't find some basic food items because the prices are so high, they've gone. So in order to buy something like pasta, which has replaced rice that is too expensive in Iran, it is the women who queue up. And so I think the double burden has become quadruple burden in Iran. So it, it really is a very um, that's why you do see women so active in the protest. But no, this is not uh, just a feminist movement. It's the right, it's the imperialists who try and reduce it to that. Because that way, as other right people points out, then you don't challenge capitalism. All you're challenging is the, the Islamic State. Capitalism is fine, it's fantastic. Look uh, how liberated all women are in the West. So why should we worry about it? Um, 
it is a worker struggle. There are, uh, I won't repeat because it was already mentioned, the list of strikes is just unbelievable. And many of us were kept thinking, well, what will happen to these strikes? And now they're taking a new dimension because there are protests as well. Um, workers go to work, work a whole 30 day months, and they are not paid. And quite a lot of these companies are owned by multi-billionaires who are associated with the regime, our revolutionary gods, or some of them are from the ancien regimes. There are quite a lot of rich Iranians who never lost their fortunes after 1979. Because as, as I said, Khomeini was not, a, uh, was not uh, was a defender of private property and capitalism. So it's inevitable, that's a thing. And remember that these workers aren't paid in a country that wants to develop nuclear weapons on the black market. So it has money, but it hasn't got money to pay the poor car worker or the uh, uh, workers who went on strike in half that. It's in my, I think I won't repeat everything about nationalism, but I agree entirely. There are many attempts to make this uh, ethnic nationalist struggle, but they have all failed. And one of the forces that wants to make this a nationalist struggle, because then you would have all these divisions between not just Kurdistan, Arabs, Kurds, Baluchis, and so on, is Saudi Arabia. Because for Saudi Arabia, that would be a solution where there would be no Iran. There'd be all these states, small states, so you don't have to worry about them. And I think that has failed. One of the websites in Iran, I read an article, it talked of post nationalism in Iran, which is very good. Because if it is, it, it doesn't mean people don't consider themselves ethnically Kurd, Baluch, Arab, but the solidarity between these nationalities is remarkable and we have to give it credit. I think the causes of 79, some are common with the current one, but some are very different. So of course, repression, censorship, but as I said earlier, the interference of the state in the private lives of people didn't exist. Dictatorships like the Shah's dictatorship are clever enough not to start telling people what to eat, what to drink. They let them live their lives. In fact, they prefer if they live their lives in whatever they, uh, then they push mass media with rubbish TV and so on. And uh, that way they can keep the country quiet. This law wanted to change a generation that has no association with religion, no uh, sympathy for Islam force them to be religious. And you can imagine the result is the exact opposite. Laicity is now the highest. The young people in Iran, you really can't find anyone who considers themselves either religious or at least even if they do consider themselves religious, they don't believe that an um, Islamic state should tell others what to do. Uh, <clears throat> There is a, another difference, and that is that in 1979, there were anti-US and um, anti-imperial slogan. Those have gone. And here again, we should blame the Islamic Republic. The Islamic Republic tried to do all the deals that it could with the West, with imperialism. I don't believe it's a sub-imperialist country. Imperialism has definitions. A small state that can't even afford to pay its own workers. Uh, is not a sub imperialist but this is a country that has destroyed the feelings for, if you like, um, anti-imperialism, the demands for opposition to uh, Western um, intervention, interference, and the young people have a lot of illusions about the West, and that is a danger, not because there's, uh, you know, not, not because they're opposing the Islamic Republic, that's a good thing, but illusions about capitalism, about the West can be dangerous. I see many don't, but there are some who do, and that presents itself as a danger. In terms of 2017 and 2019, uh, yes, these were uh, uh, protests against abolitions of subsidies, 
they were direct consequence of the neoliberal economic policies of successive reformist and non-reformist Islamic states, including Ahmadinejad, who won the praise from IMF as the model country for following neoliberal economic policies. However, they were much shorter. And of course, in a country where poverty is one of the main issues, where really people are struggling to feed themselves, and yet it is it shouldn't be in this poor state, but where people have difficulty feeding themselves, the abolition of subsidies is a very, very serious matter. A couple of very short points. I don't think um, that uh, we should worry too much about those sections of the left who support the Islamic Republic or consider it anti-imperialist, I would say they are very, very small minority nowadays. There are some, I'm not saying that one can't deny that. As uh, uh, unbelievable as it might be, there are people who consider that. They are mistaken. Some of them have illusions about China. Some of them have uh, their general politics is pro-Russia and Ukraine, pro-Islamic Republic. But at the end of the day, some of them are older, some are younger. That's a minority. I think the majority, the problems that the Iranian left faces are illusions about foreign intervention. And they're, if you like, um, the shift to the right that has affected a large section of the Iranian left in exile, not inside the country. I don't want to either cause problems for the people inside Iran, or uh, nor do I have any uh, uh, documented evidence about that. So I'm not referring to the left inside Iran. The left outside Iran has become, uh, after 44 years of exile, and given the pressures of, if you like, the right wing move globally, the Iranian left in exile has moved to the right. Um, and you, here you can divide it into categories. Not everyone in, is in that category, uh, but some, who, especially those who have benefited financially from uh, uh, EU funds, from funds for national endowment for democracy, the US project for new American century, these types of people are now associating themselves directly and openly with what I would call the imperialist alternative, uh, the attempts by imperialism to find alternative leadership. Those attempts have so far failed, but as comrades keep telling me, they might succeed with not with these individuals that we are seeing, but with another scenario. And here, um, I, I would say the rightward shift of the Iranian left is a very dangerous situation. Again, it doesn't cover everyone. Many are not in that position. They oppose both the pro-China, pro-Islamic Republic uh, category, and they oppose the pro-imperialist left. Um, but I think that's the challenge we are facing daily when we try and organize demonstrations, when we go to protest, when we talk to people, th these are issues that affect us. I believe I've finished my time, so I'll stop and then I'll come back. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, so now you both have um, the opportunity to respond to each other, but as you do, I would also like to um, you know, kind of ask some questions. Maybe you can consider them or don't. Um, and then we will open it up for um, the general audience. Um, so, so some of the questions that came up while you both were talking um, about Iran. Um, so one of them um, was that Yasam, Yasamin, um, you wrote an article about the class dimension of the hijab. Um, whereas Azar has talked about women and workers as if though they were separate. Um, so do women have their own political standpoint or is there like, um, do women in Iran who are like considered middle or upper class, do they have the same interests as women who are working class? Um, so that would be one question. And then also another question um, would be that, um, what was the role um, 
of the left in 1979. Yasmin, you talked a little bit about that, um, but I want to specify it a little bit also for Azar, um, saying that given the popular frontist strategy of the Tude party and also the Fedayin uh, majority in 1979, which helped the ascent of Khomeini uh, um, and kind of underestimating him and kind of um, having this like cross-class alliance, um, <clears throat> Um, yeah, are there any lessons we can draw from this today, especially given that Yasaman, you just said that there are leftists here who are kind of um, inverting that kind of anti-imperialist logic of 1979 and saying that we should work together and demand our own imperialists to kind of intervene on behalf of democracy in Iran. So it kind of seems that there is like a historical parallel there um, and that there might be some lessons that we can draw from this. And you, you guys can talk about what were the problems? What is the problem with this kind of popular frontism, as I would call it, this kind of like alliance between, um, you know, workers in Iran and some strata of the bourgeoisie in Iran or some strata of the bourgeoisie in the West. Um, and then um, the third question, which is connected to that, um, would be why can the current uprising not lead to an authoritarian or liberal form of capitalism? Why can only socialism fulfill the bourgeois democratic demands of the Iranians? I think Azar has, um, in her in one of her videos that I saw, she explained why it's only possible to have socialism in Iran, why any other capitalist form, um, if it is liberal or authoritarian, uh, why it cannot last in Iran? Um, and why, for example, is it not imaginable that you can have some kind of outcome like um, some states in Latin America, for example, which were also, you know, dominated by imperialism and so on? Why can it not be like that in Iran? Um, yeah, that would be my questions. And you both have like five to 10 minutes to respond to each other also. And then I will open it up to the audience. Thank you so much. Other, you're still muted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think it's okay now. I'm just going to answer these questions that you just mentioned. There's, there's so much of it. And I you know, it's so difficult to talk about Iran and this whole history and no more than 15, 20 minutes. So I always kind of lose time. I just go to these questions and try to be quick. Um, see, I did not say women that, if you remember, I said women's liberation movement. You see, you have different socio-political movements in this and then working class movement when, when not workers again, Workers are in all different movements. They could be uh, even for a liberal state, just because they're workers, they're not, they're not for socialism, right? But what we're talking about is their movement. The working class movement is a movement against capitalism by definition, but then there are workers who could be involved in different other kinds of movements. And then, so I'm not talking about individuals and saying whether this woman belongs to the working class or doesn't, but different social political movements. I myself was not born into the working class and I'm not part of the working class by my job or career or whatever you want to call it. But I would consider myself one of the working class movement because I've always fought for socialism against capitalism and for an equal and free society and so on and so forth. So when I talk about many times you would have, like in Iran, I was trying to say why women's rights movement, women's freedom movement, liberation, I call it liberation movement, why it plays a very important role and why it's part of the revolutionary movement now. If Islamic regime is overthrown and another bourgeois government comes to power, something that the West wants to do and is trying to do right now, it's writing its scenario, then maybe the women's liberation movement would die away, would still some uh, demands would stay, but as a strong as it is now would not exist, for example. You, you, so it's, I'm just going to close this. So what, what, I see, what I see is not different people belonging with, concretely to which class, but the movement I'm talking about. And then um, I would like to now because it's related, I'll go to the third question first and then come back to the second one. 
Why cannot? See, Iran, this is this has been our theory from 1979, 1980, um, the, what that became work of communist movement, Masur Hekmat is leader and theoretician. Well, these were the theories that we discussed from the from then that as an as a uh, country under sort of the if you like on, on imperialism, I would you use it in a different term, but just to not to make more problems, I just use this definition. In these countries, you could not have free like democracy in the sense you have in the West. Capitalism in those countries need extreme exploitation of the workers in order to create that situation that in extreme exploitation of workers is possible, you need a dictatorship. You say some Euro uh, South American countries, if you look at it, even Brazil had a few years of a little bit of democracy and then a fascist came to power. And now again, you don't know what will happen. How many uh, coup d'etats have US tried to organize in the past decade in South America? Africa, the same thing. Uh, Asia, all of it. Middle East is all ruined. So when you look at it, even in the West now, democracy is becoming more limited, especially after the COVID and now with the Ukraine war. You cannot have in Iran, maybe for a couple of years, just like between 1979 and 1981, you would not be able to have a degree of democracy, a degree of freedom of expressions or political opposition because the extreme exploitation of workers needs a dictatorship. So that's why I cannot see a liberal state. If you mean something like France or Britain or that kind of democracy would never happen in Iran. You would might have it for a couple of years till the uh, um, powers, uh, till, till the balance of power changes. Exactly the scenario that happened in 1979 to 1980. And this is what we are, I am definitely fearing now because especially since the Ukraine war, we hear a lot now, we see that the regime change in Iran has become part of the agenda of the US and the West. And you see how they're creating this lib sort of funny uh, leaders for Iranian, Iranian peoples, go to Elysee Palace, go to the White House, the, all these things they've been doing. And I read just last night that US and Israel have, um, have just just one. They are they are holding drills, airstrike drills against Iran. Twenty second of November they agreed on it. It's going to happen soon. And Biden has just yesterday or the day before said that if they have to, they would resort to military intervention in Iran. So they're not joking. It if they cannot do what they want to do, what the exact scenario is, I don't know. We're going to see an inc a, a, a sort of real uh, intervention of the US and NATO in Iran. So that's why we need, we need to overthrow capitalism as well. And just very quickly to your second question, the left as, as, as a sort of aspiration, I keep using this word, was strong in Iran even in 1979. But the majority of the left was populist movement and anti-imperialist in that sense of the word. So Khomeini actually could fool them. When Khomeini said death to America, they all said to the party was not really part of the left at that time. To the party was there, but it was, and to the party from the beginning supported the regime totally. And then we had part of Fadai, which was a very big organization, majority, did the same, they did it very horribly, even helping them with in, um, uh, uh, arresting leftists and interrogation and all of that. They went all the way in a very, very nasty way. And But the left very quickly actually came to the realization and uh, that's why we had so many left people dying under torture and being executed. And the left became stronger. So we had the creation of the Communist Party of Iran, which communist militants I was member of. We were uh, with Komele, we created that and then da, da, da. I'm not going to take the time of it. So uh, the left has always been strong in Iran, but now it's even stronger, not maybe in terms of organization because it's not, we cannot create organizations now, but also it's very progressive. You don't see much, you know, in the, in the, in the movement, 
that happening in Iran, you don't see anti-imperialists in that sense of the word. They don't want US to intervene, but they're not that anti-imperialist populist movement that you might hear that some uh, international or leftist um, Western ones are, or the one we saw in 1979. One slogan, which is actually interesting, I just say that and finish, there's, there's very widespread, is it, that's death to the oppressor, be it Shah, which is the monarchy, the, 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 the previous regime, or leader, which meaning Khamenei. And this slogan has created a lot of problems for the West in the regime change, because they want to bring the Shah's son, but people already have said no. So this is, this is the way it's going. There is, I, I might say, as a young person being active in 1979, by no means I was so clear-minded about what's happening as the young generation now. I'm sure Yasaman will agree with me. They're very, very clear what they want to do. They're very insightful. And what that we lacked as the young generation of 1979. Thank you. Yeah, um, OK. Uh, I really don't have major disagreements. I just want to add a couple of points. Um, when I wrote about hijab being class-oriented, uh, it was just to prove to these people that in the West are just talking about you know, a particular group of people. It is true that um, in the very, very poor areas of Iran, in shanty towns, hijab might not be important partly because of the conditions of life are so terrible. But for the very, very rich Iranians, including very close relatives of senior ayatollahs, uh, the rule of hijab is very relaxed, especially if they are in their own areas in north of Tehran, in areas that Ershad didn't used to go. So it was the working class women, the middle class, the working women who weren't middle class because impoverishment of the middle classes has reached such a stage where you can't call teachers in Iran middle class, they are working class now. And uh, nurses, people like that. It was them, women who tried to have even part-time jobs that had to fight daily with this stupid uh, laws that came and said, oh, it's not strong enough. Oh, you're showing your fringe. Oh, your hair cut isn't the right color. It's too bright or whatever. And this really was an insult to women. But also, I think there is, we can't deny whatever we call it, we can't deny the fact that women were prominent in this opposition for the reasons that Azar is talking about, because of apartheid against women, because of, um, as I said, the feminization of poverty. I mean, poverty had become an issue stronger hitting women. And so the, I wouldn't separate it as women versus workers. I would say women and workers and women workers, women working class women, or women who support the working class. The left in 79 was totally confused. So, some, I was still abroad, I couldn't go back, but some some went back from abroad, so they really were new to the situation in Iran. Some um, were just out of prison, so they couldn't interfere much. But those who had escaped prison because they were in East Germany or Moscow or wherever were two departed people, and they all went with the slogan, it's coming back. The United Front Against Dictatorship. You couldn't make it up. You know, it's uh, it's the worst slogan you could have. And they're coming back with it now. Now again, they're saying exactly it's the same word. GFK Vahed is the dictatorship, a United Front Against Dictatorship. And you think, have you learned nothing for the last 44 years? Have you buried your heads in sand for 44 years? After you gave our names for the police to arrest us, as Azad was saying, then they came for you yourselves. They arrested you as well. And, you know, these people are really a disaster. Um, I also don't think that uh, bourgeois liberalism will last I wouldn't even give it a year, uh, maybe two years is the maximum, but I wouldn't give it a year. 
Look what happens when a state comes to power. It faces the continuation of strike. Do you think these workers who've gone on strike would suddenly go back? It's exactly what happened in 79. The oil workers in Tehran refinery were continuing their strikes. So the government sent Hezbollah with um, chains to attack the, the workers. Uh, by that time, I'd gone back. I could see it. So this is the kind of state we are talking about. But it, at that time, the situation in the Middle East was far more calm than it is now. Now we are talking of a situation where um, Iraq is in disaster, Afghanistan is in disaster. It's going to be impossible. There'll be so many other contradictions that will exist. Then you have the young people who haven't just fought against the religious state. They will want to get some of the demands they're talking about now, jobs, security of jobs, um, uh, good pay, a future. And what kind of state can produce this in the ashes of the Islamic Republic? So no, we will have a scenario like, I would say maybe General Sisi, you know, he would have a couple of weeks where there will be, some of us might be able to go back to visit our families for a very short time before we need to escape again, because we'll be arrested as lefties. And uh, dictatorship will come back, repression will come back. So no, I can't see, I can't envisage that at all. Thank you. That's all I think. Thank you both. Um, so there was one question um, or no, actually two questions already um, uh, sent to me, but I will give um, Anna McShane um, the opportunity to ask her a question first, and then I will read out uh, Richard Rubin's questions. But Richard, you can also just raise your hand and ask those questions yourself if you like. Okay, Anna, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm based here in Ireland and I have been involved for a number of years in solidarity work. Um, with the Hands Off People of Iran, um, which we began in around 2009. Um, so my, I suppose, it's a point and a question. Um, for me, I think it's really essential that we integrate the struggle for women's emancipation with the struggle of the working class. Um, not only because of the fact that leaving it as a woman's question allows the United States and other powers to interfere and weaponize the question as they did in Afghanistan, but also I believe, and, and I have studied this question and I've studied Soviet women um, and their struggle, is that it seems like it becomes something that's superficial rather than something that is about emancipation and the working class as a tribune of all oppressed classes. And, it seems that, or do you think, I suppose my question is, do you think in Iran that the movement has already got that, the integral nature of this question to all their lives? And the second question is a very brief one. How can we, uh, comrades abroad, assist uh, at the present time? How can we show solidarity with the movement? Thank you, thank you. So Yasaman or Azar, you can both respond to her question. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Very quickly, I would say until now that wasn't the case, i.e. the women's liberation movement in Iran was separate. But I would say the last few weeks have really changed that. And we are seeing an integrated workers' women's struggle. And it's very good because, as I said, there are the, the enemy is the same, the demands are very common, and so on. My concern is that um, uh, as the protest continues, women would lose out or there would be attempts at reducing their role in some of the um, major struggles. But at the moment, I don't see it. So yes, I believe there is a there is a need. It's 50% of the population. But most importantly, unless we take this seriously, we have this situation where uh, the superficial equality 
for example, the number of women ministers or in a bourgeois government or number of CEOs in companies is portrayed as women's liberation. This isn't women's liberation. Women's liberation must affect the, the plight of women in the house. It must deal with the issue of exploitation in the house. As, and that can't be done if the working class movement is not considering some of the things that Anne herself has worked on, uh, communal kitchens, communal looking after children. These are lessons we know exist. And so I I hope that is where we are, but I can't be sure. And I hope we are there. Um, in terms of solidarity, I think the fact that if we should, we should have more meetings like this, other meetings, we should expose the, the hypocrisy of Prince Albert of Monaco or Meghan Markle or Tony Blair or, you know, or the Elise Palace, the other mention. We really should, the, the place to expose these people is in Europe for protesters inside Iran. They don't know half of the time they're busy doing their jobs and they're facing severe repression. It is here that we have to expose these people. They are not supporters of the Iranian working class or Iranian women. They just want regime change at their style. So there's a lot we can do, both by meetings, by writing, but also by talking to um, other people and organizing meetings. I, I really don't know a lot more to say, thanks. So. Father, you can also respond. Yes, uh, I 100% agree with Anne about the women's emancipation. That was an old word we used to use. The terms change uh, or liberation uh, cannot happen in capitalism. I quite agree with her. And I'm not only meaning women workers. I mean, if we really want liberation and equality in real terms, then it cannot happen. Look what, how many liberation uh, movements have happened in the history. I've really studied women's liberation movement a lot because it's been my own interest. Soviet Union is one of them. Or the liberation movement of the 60s and 70s. It was strong. It was all over the West. What happened? Of course, there have been changes. No, no doubt about that. They have, but in essence, it hasn't. But what has happened now in this identity politics era, like what uh, Yasemin was also mentioning, is tokenism. Only token. Now, on, both on racism and gender issues, you have tokenism with this identity politics. And also a toxic environment in the society against men. men. So they have to, you know, because then women, whatever women say now is just in social media. Hillary Clinton is not a women's rights leader. So whether Hillary Clinton is president, foreign minister, whatever, see what she has done as part of the Western ruling class to the Middle East. I'm not talking about other places, to Libya, to the here and there. So of course, but what it is at the moment, as Yosemi said, there is this great awareness because of the social, you see, revolution, revolution, as Marx and Engels and Lenin and all they have talked about, it has its own dynamism. It's something you cannot know from before, and you don't know how this dynamism goes about. So, but what happens, this social movement of women's liberation movement has been taken all over the country. You hear men and women talk about it. Workers are talking about it. Everywhere is talking about it. Whereas in 1979, men had nothing to do with that movement we had, very few did. And also the left was really um, belittling it. I mean, Yasamin was not there, I was there. How we had to also fight the left men, not women, because women leftists were there fighting. But now it's changed, it's a whole different atmosphere. And it could go on like that, or it could be stopped. It's something that we cannot know from uh, before. But what it is, if the West, as is trying now, the Western ruling class, succeeds in a regime change, 
to bring Iranian nationalism this time, last time was Islamic, now nationalism, back to the country with the crown or without the crown, doesn't matter. But that, that previous regime, if they succeed, you would, the veil would go, some of the, these uh, sort of limitations would go, and then they could calm down the movement. Still, small women's liberation movement would go on, like people like you, me, and I mean, leftists, or someone, but then it would it would stop. This is this is part of we've seen it in history happens so many times. You have a very vibrant social movement, and after it did some changes in social political, it stops. So what we have to try to do to keep it as vibrant as possible, and all these social movements, they shout freedom equality all the time on the streets. It's not freedom, it's freedom and equality. And that means a lot. And they also talk about on, on, against poverty as Yasama mentioned, so I didn't go into it. And the, 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 if, if we can keep this going and we can succeed in overthrowing the regime and bringing people's councils instead of a regime change to Iran, then it would go to where Anne was talking about, Yasami was talking about, or I'm talking about, but it could, could die. What we can do, I totally agree with Yasama, and uh, I just w- would like to add one more thing. We should be aware of what the Western ruling class is trying to do. And we should say very clearly in our protests, hands off Iran, totally, meaning no military and no uh, regime change scenario. We should be aware, the left in the West needs to be aware and this is one of the instruments of solidarity with Iranian people. It's very important. I, I'm, I'm totally worried with the way they're talking now that they might do what they did in 1979 again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we can take other questions. Um, if people like to raise their hands. I mean, I have two questions already from Richard Rubin. Um, he has asked you, do you agree that it is appropriate to compare Islamist politics to European fascism, or does the former require a different specific analysis? So he's asking about the, you know, um, category of Islamic fascism, if um, that's comparable to European fascism, um, as in Italy or in Germany before. And the term imperialism has been used What is your understanding of the term and what are the criteria to determine if a country is imperialist? Also, I would like to add another question for myself um, because you both were saying that we as leftists um, here in the West, we need to um, oppose the kind of threat that is coming from the um, imperialists like um, the US government and such. Um, How do you like, how do you do this as individuals or do you propose that we should be like in a campaign like hands off the people of Iran or is there a political party needed who are the people like uh, when you say leftists here like who are the people here in the west and what role does the working class if any if you think it has any role um, here in Great Britain or in France or in Germany or in the US what role does it play Um, I mean traditionally Uh, what you kind of had when you talked about international class solidarity, it meant that workers here also had the capacity to strike or to um, politically um, pressure their own, pressurize their own uh, imperialists. But now, nowadays, it seems like what is meant by solidarity is kind of vague. It's kind of like, okay, we go to the streets and we shout our solidarity for Iran. But what do you, what do you guys uh, mean by this? Um, Okay, thank you so much. Go ahead, either one of you. <laughs> okay, I'll go down because I'll start with that. I think Islamic politics in Iran has had fascist tendencies. You can't deny that. When uh, the head of the country declares, which was Khomeini, declares jihad against an entire nation, the Kurdish people, as he did in August 1979. I mean, that is science, it's not a normal state. However, I think 
if you use the term fascism about every entity that comes along, you diminish its significance. And its significance is very clear it, when you define, for example, um, the um, Nazi party in Germany. It has, uh, it has a history, it has uh, a political agenda against a particular race. I would say the Islamic Republic has had fascistic policies against various side, various parts of uh, the country, against women, against national minorities, against workers. But it's not what you would call a fascist country. If you call it a fascist country, what would you do if you face a real fascist country, right? The, I think playing with words is not a good idea. It might it might make you feel very radical or I've given a very harsh slogan against the Islamic Republic, but I don't see it, I don't see it as justifying uh, the, um, the reality. It doesn't fit with me. I, it's not that I would say aspects of Iran's policies have been worse than fascism. It has been more brutal in many aspects than fascists were. Uh, but to to consider it a classical example of a fascist country would be mistaken would be a mistake in terms of imperialism again the definitions should include the exploitation never mind the, i'm not into going to repeat lenin's definition but if you look at our era it should include exploitation of the working class of another country and here just because a country has ambitions which it can't ever achieve as to extending its frontiers, it doesn't become an imperialist country. For that reason, Iran's Islamic Republic might have ambitions about Lebanon, Iraq. It's a very complicated question. It's not as simple as that because you could say it, Daesh was also a threat to Iran, but it, Iran might have such ambitions but it's in no position to do anything about it. Wherever it has been, it's been as um, it, it, groups that have been smashed by Israel or other people, rightly so, because they couldn't fight. They, they weren't in that position. So calling Iran imperialist is a is misuse of the term. On the other hand, Imperialism isn't just the US. For example, the current, I would argue that the current policies of China are imperialist policies. The way it uses the Roads and Belt uh, program to exploit the countries in Africa, countries all over the world, makes it an imperialist country. But I would not use that term about Iran. That's where I stand. Um, and uh, in terms of how we would do it, I, I mean, I think we are all beginning to find each other. We are finding people who are close to each other in terms of opinion. So the Iranian left has to organize itself better in Europe, in the United States. But um, uh, I think what we can do is get solidarity from trade unions, from teachers unions. The teachers unions in Britain should be addressed to give solidarity to the teachers who've been on strike. We should organize such actions. We should also, of, of course, I want people to join hands of people of their own, but it doesn't mean if this is not the only organization, other organizations are doing similar work. And we should build coordination between those of us who are not pro-US, who are not soft on uh, US alternatives and make our voices heard. That's it. Thank you, Azar. Go ahead if you want to answer. You need to, yeah. Yeah, okay. I do it, but I just said it's always better to go number two because some of the things are said and you don't need to repeat it. Um, well, um, um, fascism. You see, I don't. I don't see. I also. Why do we need to? Why do we need to use this word? For example, because fascism uh, in Europe 
had this particular ideology, for example, okay, against the Jewish people, but then was also against co communists, against lefties, against any opposition, and against the homosexuals, and all of that. In that sense, yes, Islamic uh, regime is the same, exactly the same, against communists, against any opposition, against the homosexuals, against, it, you know, whatever. So um, I usually don't use this term myself, because then, um, it, it would have the kind of implications that necessarily doesn't work. But what we have is a Islamic movement and Islamic regime in Iran, very brutal, a murderous uh, organization and regime that tolerates no opposition and also culturally is very backward, like its relationship to women and the veil and gender apartheid to sexual freedom and to homosexuality, all of these things is. So um, in, in, in that sense, let's let, for example, what you had with Pinochet or all those military uh, dictatorships in South, South America or in Africa, there, there, there's always similarities. So let's say it's a, it's, a, it's a brutal, murderous, reactionary, suppressive movement. I think that would be enough. And as Yasama said, with, of course, there are similarities with fascist movement because in, at the end of the day, they all want one thing. They want to suppress and they want to uh, exploit and uh, have a dictatorship. Some uh, murder, some like they, there's against Jew, Jewish people here could be against something else. So that's that's what I would say. And uh, how do we? Uh, oh, and with imperialism, you see, I don't think really we can still apply. Lenin's definition of imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism that he sort of came about about more than um, almost one century ago. But what I see, you have the uh, Western or the kind of powers, and then you have all the other parts of the world that are being exploited and the Western governments are exploiting them in different ways. So Iran is one of those countries Iran, Iran has always, because of its population, oil, and what, whatever it had, even at the time of the Shah, it was, it was called then gendarme of the, the region by the West. It fought in Zofar, it fought here for the West. This time is uh, not so much uh, uh, with the West, but it does play in the hands, like in Syria, what it does in Lebanon and Hezbollah and all of that. So. So we actually came uh, with the definition of we have state terrorism and Islamic terrorism. In 2001, when the, um, when the US attacked Afghanistan, this was something Mansour Ahmad was talking about. He said, we have two ter state terrorism and Islamic terrorism, and we should stand against both of them instead of imperialism, or, because that was always a problem with anti-imperialists wanting to defend a country that's apparently saying that's to America. We've always had that problem in Iran, and now we have it in the West. I've seen some leftist anti-imperialists who, who are not actually believing that there is a real movement against the re Iranian regime to, in Iran. So this, I think if you define it that way, it would be much, much more understandable. But whatever it is, you have the Western governments, the ruling class, NATO nations, plus the U I mean, US, all of that, that they have an agenda, they, they want dictatorship everywhere in, in the world, they, if they, and they, they create wars, they ruin, they plunder, they do all of that. So there is this kind of difference that we, have, we, we should have in mind. I, I hope it's clear. And then about what, I mean, of course, if you could have groups would be, would be um, perfect, if you could create some kind of leftist broad organizations, not necessarily thinking the same way on every details, but we know that we want a free Iran. We want, we want the people in Iran, the working class in Iran, to be able to get, take matters in their own hands, hands off Iran from the NATO and US and all of that. And so let people themselves choose what they want for a better world in Iran and a more just world in Iran. That could be our platform. And then we create this kind of uh, uh, broad uh, group or uh, organization, what you want to call it, who defends who's, uh, the uh, movement, the revolutionary movement 
in, in Iran. And could also, what is to me important, I keep saying it, is both defend the revolutionary movement in Iran and have your eyes on your own state or the Western state, what they're trying to do. Like now, if really what Biden is saying is they want to, they want to attack militarily if they can't do anything else, then that's something we have to be prepared to oppose. As, as a whole leftist, compassionate human, human beings in, in, in living in, in the West. In that sense, I think, so these meetings, as Yasaman also said, if we have more meetings like that and we can get into the protest, of course, we should ask the working class of the West, but unfortunately, trade unionism itself can be an issue because they, trade unionism is also they, part of and parcels of the, the regimes there are like in, in Britain, maybe now they, they, they are a bit disillusioned about the Labour Party, but they were part and parcel of the Labour Party and Labour Party was the party that attacked uh, Iraq. So this is, this is the problem. I'm sure there are leftist workers, but trade unions as such, I still don't have much uh, faith in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Nizam, uh, you're first, and then Victor, you can ask your questions. You can, if you like, you can ask them like, you know, Nizam, you can first ask your question and then Victor, and then you um, both can respond to it. Um, seeing how we're kind of running out of time, that will be wiser, I think. Thank you. Um, I want to ask, since it seems like, um, like in Iran, it's, you all said that it's not really possible to achieve the real interests without overcoming capitalism. And at the other hand, small reforms like freedom of not, not having to wear the wheel or equality won't be achievable either in the Islamic State. Could you specify what you think are the, what is the best possible outcome from the current protests? It sounds like it's like, okay, to have Shora, I mean, to work, workers' councils. Um, so do you think the best possible outcome of this protest wave or this uh, current yeah, uh, rebellion could be um, to start leftist organizations or what what else is most most yeah at best achievable and the other thing is do you think that if the protests just go on there's also a risk of like Iran uh, ending up in a worse situation like in a failed state or anything yeah more regressive in a way Uh, I'll also ask a very brief question uh, that I think complements Nizam's very important questions. Uh, yes, Amin said uh, that it would be nice to begin uh, uh, organizing groups and leftists uh, now, uh, and I thought that was quite disheartening. What, what has been happening over the past 40 years uh, in the Iranian left, uh, in the diaspora, uh, but also in the sort of world left that this is something that should be started now and that isn't uh, already happening because it seems a little bit late uh, uh, to be uh, uh, raising the possibility uh, as a sort of utopian even uh, uh, possibility now uh, that the protests are even like far underway and indeed to go back to Nizam's question uh, isn't if none of this exists or is likely to happen, isn't the most likely outcome of these protests uh, an even more authoritarian uh, state or even a, a failed state or sort of a, a civil war, um, a Syrian situation? Okay, thank you, Victor. Uh, Said, if that question is uh, related, um, maybe you can also ask it now. If not, you can ask it um, later. Okay, no. Okay. Okay, so um, guys, go ahead and answer the question, please, if you like. <laughs> Aza, you can go first, I think. Um. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, what is the best possible result, as Nizam was asking? To my opinion, the best, well, first of all, overthrow of the Islamic regime as soon as possible, because the, the longer it stays, the, the more people suffer and more people will be killed and tortured and imprisoned. And so, of course, we want this to happen with the, the, le the least number of deaths and 
uh, casualty. Uh, and then, of course, the end is not here. This is just the beginning of a new chapter. You overthrow this regime, then you want to have your, the, 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 the regime or the political system that's most beneficial for the people. And to my opinion, that would be uh, moving towards socialism, overthrowing capitalism. And the only way we can do it is, to my opinion, with councils, not only workers' councils, workers' councils and councils of in different neighborhoods by the people. Uh, this this, this the best guarantee that we could have a, a better society, a better world, a more just one, more freedom, freedom, equality, and prosperity for all the citizens. It's not easy. I know it's not easy. It's, 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 it's a very, very difficult job, but this is to me is the best uh, possible uh, solution. It is, we all want the regime overthrow of the regime, and we all want to see these people to be tried for crime against humanity for what they've done to the people of Iran. But the thing is, if they go, and the people don't take things in their own hands, workers don't take things in their hands, then we will have another bourgeois capitalist government that would be like this one or the previous one, couple of years of a little bit of freedom, and then again, the same thing, the same old story would repeat itself. This is something that I'm worried about a lot. Can Iran end in a failed state? There is a possibility. I mean, how, I, mean I cannot say no. I would be, you know, I wish not. And what I look, for example, when I when I compare Iran with Syria or Tunisia or Egypt or Libya, in those what was called the Arab Spring, there are a lot of differences. Like, for example, uh, you know, in in Egypt or in Tunisia, uh, there were not this much awareness of, of what people wanted and uh, left was not as strong and slogans as well. And the workers were not as, um, as, as organized in a way, maybe um, and uh, aware as you see from, from afar, of course, I would read about it. I would try to follow it. And uh, so that's why I think they could easily fall into the hands of, for example, in Egypt, fall into the hands of the Muslim Brotherhood. And then when the Muslim Brotherhood people got afraid of, and then they went for this Syria, the, the, the general, and then things became even worse. Or Syria, Syria US had a very, very important role to create the state. Like in Syria, US still uh, occupies Raqqa where the oil is being produced and takes the oil away and sell it. And Israel also plays a very important. So all of these things could happen about in Iran too. That's why I'm worried when I they talk about military drills against Iran and Biden saying that he would military get involved if he cannot solve it other ways. But uh, we'll, we'll just hope that the awareness that people have and the way the movement is going forward could perhaps stop it. And with the solidarity of the people in the West, if we can organize that and stop the uh, Western governments to interfere. And uh, I think that was all, if I'm not. Uh, authoritarian state, that was another question. If people cannot get things into their own hands, if we, can, we cannot um, have, like I would say, councils would be the best solution, we would then, Yes, we would have another authoritarian regime. Two years, maybe I give it. The same scenario would be repeated. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Azar. Uh, Yasemin, please. Um, okay. Yeah, I think um, uh, the longer the protests go, as we are seeing new forms of organization, internal organization for it. and. In some ways, those are positive. I, yes, of course, things can get worse, but the current situation is a situation that we would have faced. It's in, it would have been inevitable. You can't have, in the 21st century, a generation that is growing up aware of what is going on globally through their phones, through their computers, an educated young 
population. Iran has large number of universities, so quite a lot of these people go to universities and they don't have jobs. Yeah, they have to do um, stay completely dependent on their relatives and so on. You can't have such a situation and then try and say, oh no, we are going to segregate every place you go. You have to wear this type of clothes. You can't drink you can't, of course, most people in Iran drink, but you can't drink if we find out you've been drinking. And this is not something you can do in the 21st century. So the, the fall of this state, of the religious state, was on the cards for decades, for at least two decades. I would say longer, but at least two decades, when the generation of internet didn't accept its existence. And it has to go. It might create a worse solution, but you can't stop the momentum that has started. The momentum has started. If we stop it, we would be counter-revolutionaries. If you're trying to say, oh, let's reduce it, let's stop it, let's do less about it. And you are right what we are asking for in terms of defeating both capitalism and Achieving democracy, uh, overthrow the Islamic Republic and freedom is high demands. But I think, in fact, we are realistic. We are the reason we are asking for what seems to be um, a, a, a very high demand is because we are realistic. We know what will happen if it's just a bourgeois state. It will repress the working class. It will, okay, women might have some freedoms, but or the youth might have some freedoms in terms of going to disco and so on, but that would be it. Everything else will be the same. The unemployment rate will not change. The factories will not open. Um, not unpaid wages will not go away. There is no way you could have 80 million people in a country where the gap between the rich and the poor is the way it is in Iran and have a bourgeois state that brings peace and love and happiness. Um, Victor's point is valid. Uh, <laughs> we are all victims of the many failures of not just the Iranian left, the international left. And of course, we, all of us, I, I would start with myself, have been um, sectarian, have been, um, uh, for some of our uh, time, we've been just blinded by one particular view. We haven't tolerated opponents and so on. But what I do see, in fact, right now, amongst those sections of the exiled left, Iranian left, who are no longer, if you like, uh, associated, the majority are no longer associated with political parties. The day, I would say the political parties have kept very few percentage of their members. I see amongst those sections of the left who are not pro-American or pro-regime because they think China is uh, the, less in, the best socialist country in the world. I see amongst those a rapprochement that didn't exist before. So I agree, we, we are 40 years late, we are 60, 70 years late, we are quite late for this, but we are seeing new signs of the formation of a non-sectarian, non-party oriented left that is trying to regroup, or at least is trying to discuss the issues that we've tried to raise, other and I have tried to raise, in a peaceful way <laughs> in discussions. And I, I, that's, the movement has forced us to do this. We Maybe some of us wouldn't have bothered without it, but at least we are in slightly, I would say millimeters ahead of where we were last year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I, there are two more questions um, in the audience that were sent to me. Um, I will read them and then I have, unfortunately, I have to leave this meeting, but I will rejoin from my phone from outside, but I have to leave the building. But uh, for now, I will just um, ask these two questions and then Victor uh, will take over as host. Um, so um, one question from Nadir, uh, what, 
was should the left not just oppose regime change or intervention, um, but although have a strategy, uh, or I think he means also have a strategy which incorporates that option to make it more clear. The Bolsheviki opposed the First World War, but although um, used the situation of the war and the destabilization of the Tsarist regime uh, for the overall strategy, uh, overall strategy, being against the war was not a goal in itself, but as a means for a world revolution. So this was question number one. And then question number two um, was from Zaid uh, to Yasmin Mather. But of course, both of you can um, can respond to that. Um, Paul just raise his head and maybe he can ask him himself. Sure, sure, sure. You can ask yourself, of course. Um, uh, Zaid, please uh, raise your hand and ask it yourself. Sorry. Um, OK, I will leave, but I will rejoin from outside, OK? Thank you. Uh, so to can you hear me? Hopefully, yes. Um, to uh, Yasmin Mather, I just want to uh, follow up from her point a few minutes ago that uh, Iran is not an imperialist country, but that the U.S. and China are because they are in you know various ways expansionary. And she mentioned, for instance, China's Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so to Yasmin, then I just want to understand um, if I sort of take that line of thinking, doesn't that then mean that your concept of imperialism implies that removing the current regime in Iran uh, in a situation in which the left in Iran is unorganized or disorganized and the left internationally is unorganized and disorganized, that removing the current regime increases the possibility of uh, the sort of the future bourgeois Iranian government becoming uh, imperialist in the future, or that Iran will become more imperialist in the future as it integrates more smoothly into the, uh, into the global economy. And then, um, a question for Azar. Um, you've mentioned Lenin and um, uh, imperialism, the highest stage of um, capitalism a few times. And I just want to understand from you uh, why Lenin and why that concept of imperialism. Um, maybe if you could speak a little bit about what that concept of imperialism provides your analysis or allows you to see that other concepts of imperialism don't. Just raise your hand, uh, Azal, yes, I'm in. Sorry, I might have to leave, so I'm going to also then uh, I'll listen, but I have to leave. Um, yeah. Um, should, uh, okay, so should we use from, uh, should we use imperialist intervention to prepare the stage? I think Comparing it with 1918 and 1917, the war and 1918 is very different. We are living in a completely different time. That was an inter-imperialist war, and the war itself paved the way for a revolutionary struggle. Uh, but not, at no time, um, with the exception of Parvos, no one supported Germany, no one supported, no, no one said we will fight with the Germans because we can speed up the Bolshevik revolution. No one uh, supported the Ottoman, Parvis was saying we should support the Ottoman Empire because that would precipitate the fall of Russia. No one, Lenin didn't go for that. None of the Bolsheviks, as far as I know, none of the Mensheviks went with that. But we are in a very different situation. In the current situation, if you go down that route, uh, the, the scenarios we know exactly what will happen, Syria, Libya, Iraq, they're all examples right in front of us. First of all, there will be pressure from the allies of the United States to divide the country into different bits. The, my own view is that the United States will resist this mainly because the United States doesn't want lots of small civil wars in the region. It would have difficulty coping with that. But we are talking of an anarchy, disaster, um, civil uh, wars. The best scenario, if the army or some of these alternatives that the US want came to power, their first task will be to stop the protests, to stop the strikes, 
to attack the leaders of these protest movements. Definitely to make sure these leftist websites, these leftist thinkers that we are seeing emerging inside the country, they will be the first victims. I mean, we saw it in 79. It's going to happen far worse this time because they are more uh, evolved, these groups, they are more intelligent, and they are reading uh, international papers and so on. So definitely that will be the case. And therefore, this is a very dangerous strategy to think that you can benefit from U.S. intervention on the hopes that the anarchy will cause some kind of revolution. I, d I don't believe it. In terms of um, would, if we remove the current regime, would the future one be more imperialist? Imperialism won't suddenly take over Iran and make a nationalist a major power in the region. Imperialists will take over Iran and will have one or two options. Either the Israel and Saudi Arabia will convince them that the best solution is to divide this into lots of countries. And that way you've resolved the Iran problem forever. And that's one scenario. It's already, there is a television station broadcasting about this 24 seven. It's a plan, it's on the cards. And now they've added military attack to it, as Arda mentioned. Um, the other solution is that they will put um, a, 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 power, a, a, a client state. That client state would not be able to do anything. The Shah's government wasn't an imperialist government. The Shah's government was um, the servant of the U.S. The U.S. told it, jump, it would jump. So it will not be in a position to conquer other countries. The US will not then allow this new uh, liberal or bourgeois or whatever uh, nationalist government to expand its borders, to attack Turkey, to become the greater Iran. None of this will happen. The only thing we will witness is um, this client state of US, getting weaker and weaker and becoming more and more irrelevant while internally it will increase repression. So that's. Thanks a lot. Um, Donna is uh, in the, uh, just outside the building. So I'll, I'll moderate the end of, of this. And uh, yes, I mean, if you have to go, uh, uh, that, that's fine. I, I think Azar can perhaps answer these questions that we just uh, asked. And I'll add, I'll bring back my question that I don't think uh, Azar answered earlier um, in, in her response uh, that she forgot. Uh, yes, and I'll, I'll make it a little bit more pointed. Yes, I mean, said that if there wasn't an organized left, either an Iranian organized left in the diaspora or a more broadly an international organized left that could be, um, that could take responsibility for this movement. movement, disorganized, non-organized social movement um, uh, in uh, uh, organizing itself internationally and, and among the diaspora to uh, answer this moment, if this is why uh, things haven't worked out so far in 40 years. Thank you.
important event. But what we have to learn from it, not so much what happened, is the way that Bolshevik party and especially Lenin's role was very important in uh, understanding, realizing and capturing the moment for uh, all power to the Soviets and then creating the revolution. It failed after, to my opinion, by 1930 it failed, but still it managed to to do something so so important and significant in the world that pe still capitalists are scared of it and still the leftists talk about it. So uh, so that that situation. But, but what I learned from it is that the, the actually the role of a party, a political party, a communist party, and leadership is important to see the moments, to capture the moments and to, 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 to take action in the, at the right moment. That's important. We don't have it now, but you know, the Bolshevik party itself was a very small party, had very small uh, membership in, in Russia and um, the rest abroad, but they managed because of the revolutionary time, you, uh, leftist communism, it really grows enormously in a revolutionary time. So in that sense, yes, we have to learn, but we, sh we should not compare. I don't think these are the two. The, these two situations are are the same. Um, and uh, I forgot the name of the person who asked me about the concept of Lenin. Uh, I think I actually said Kozid. I said that concept. I don't think is valid anymore for our time. I don't want to go into it, how valid it was then or not, but for now, as the uh, stage of final stage of uh, capitalism or whatever, I don't think we talk about it in that sense. I, I don't actually use imperialism in that sense so much. Myself, uh, because it has all these problems as it has done about like Iran and Islamic regime we see now in the world. But you have these um, advanced capitalist states, and then you have the rest of the world, which uh, ha they actually ha have to be there more um, uh, sort of the working class is more uh, exploited than the working class in the West. Whereas we see now, of course, in the West is becoming so much worse too. So, so it's it's changing. It's constantly changing. It's constantly becoming more exploitative all over the world. It's not like 40 years ago, even in Europe, but this is this is the difference I see. I don't see Iran as an imperialist government, and I don't think it's gonna become an imperialist government for the near future anyway. I don't know what's gonna happen in 30, 40 years. But uh, this is, I think, it's false to look at Iran just because it plays a role in uh, Lebanon or Syria or has some kind of, in Iraq, yes, regionally it has tried to play uh, a role with this uh, Islamic terrorism, and uh, the, but it's not an imperialist government. So, and I don't really think what benefit we get from going into that route, into that path, trying to solve what's happening now in Iran. And um, Victor is asking about the left. Yes, I I agree. The left, Iranian left, was quite strong until 20 years ago. And then it, it suffered a lot. Like I was in the Communist Party, which was a very big party, was a very important party. The leader passed away. And then the party actually after that came into many different uh, parties. And unfortunately, this is, this is what happens. The left can be the victim of this kind of sectarianism is one of the issues. Um, definitely is one of the issues. But I don't think it's the only issue. The left in the world now, the, the, the as leftist aspirations are strong, but as organizations, we see nothing like there used to be 1930s or 1940s when the Second World War happened, for example, or even in the 60s and 70s. It's changed. And that's the time, it's high time now that we try to do something about it, not only in the Iranian left, but left internationally, because as we see how just look at the West in the past, since the Ukraine war and after the COVID, how much more control, censorship, and uh, um, uh, clampdown we see 
here in, the, in Europe and also in US, working class and uh, freedom of expression, uh, the censorship has grown. So we really need a strong left to oppose all of that and uh, left and any political movement that wants to have any effect whatsoever needs to be organized. You want to call it party, you want to call it organization, you need an organization. But what it is, when you have a dictatorship, as we talked about it in, uh, in the beginning, in, in a dictatorship, you cannot have any organizations. They're suppressed. Put, put, all the activists are put in jail. So but when this dictatorship is pushed back, when the balance of power has changed, you will see a lot of organizations coming out. And this time, I don't think would be like 1979, 10 different lines. It would be more collaborated as, as a tendency. So I would, we would soon see political parties, leftists I'm talking about, in Iran. And this is, we need that in order to exercise our power and our agency, we, we need to have po polit uh, political organizations. And this will come through. I've seen it in my own lifetime. I've seen what happened in 1979. I know the time is different, but social politically, the environment of the revolutionary time is still this very much similar to what Marx and Engels talked about more than 100 years ago. The same kind of dynamism happens, but in a different kind of format or different kind of, it manifests itself differently but the basic of it is the same. So I believe we will see the birth of political parties and organizations in Iran. And this time they're much more uh, clear, much more insightful, uh, theoretically much more ahead than the left of the 1979. And they will play an important role. And I think that all, all us lefties abroad will actually come together with these parties that are being will be created in Iran and try to make a difference, try to make a change for the better and for the, uh, you know, for what people want. I hope I've answered all the questions. I, from what I took notes, if I haven't, please let me know. Okay. Thank you guys. I'm uh, gonna end the meeting. Um, if you, if any of uh, you have any concluding remarks if you want to add something you can add if not i'm just going to end uh, the meeting for now and thank everyone for participating <laughs>